We're starting a, a new sermon series as we go into this, this new season of uh, school and fall and such. We're going to talk about being focused on Christ and, and who He is and uh, to try to find the right direction for our lives. If, um, if you're walking along in, in the wilderness and you're using a compass for your navigation, it's kind of important that you have the right bearing. If you're flying, for example, from Los Angeles to New York, and uh, you're just one degree off, you're going to end up quite a long ways from your destination. Being one degree off is just is very important. It might not seem like a lot, but the farther you go, the more you realize that, boy, I'm off course here. So just for, just for some fun, I kind of looked around and um, I found what it's, if you were going to go directly east from here and you went 15 miles, you would end up, let's see, if you put that on the screen there, okay, if you went 15 miles east, you'd end up in Grand Rapids. And if you went just one degree to the south of that, you'd end up a few blocks away. That might not seem like a lot, but 15 miles, that, that starts to add up. One degree off, and you end up somewhere else. And then if you go 20 miles, you'll actually end up pretty close to, to where uh, I lived when I was in college. Um, right? If you go directly east, you'll end up right on the corner of Burton and East Paris. That's 20 miles directly east of here. If you go just one degree off from that, you'll end up quite a ways south. Much I, I lived right in uh, Burton's Landing Apartments there, if you can see that on the map. There's quite a distance there if you're just one degree off. For every one degree off... If you're going in that direction, for every mile, you'll be 92 feet away from where you should be. We've picked up some ideas in our lives, in our culture, and that those ideas are, are one degree off. They seem okay, but we need to get on God's course for our lives. We have a lot of ideas in our minds that are one degree off, and they seem okay, but the longer we go with them, the farther off course we get. And we have a memory verse that I'm going to try to learn as we go through this series. Let's say it all together. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 12, 2. All right, on your way out today, there are going to be wristbands for you to take. They look like this, and it says Romans 12, 2 on them. So I want you to take one, and I want you to wear it, and I want you to remember this verse, that we not conform to what's around us, but that we be transformed by God's Word and His Spirit. So that we don't just accept what seems right, what seems like the right direction, but that we look to God's direction. So grab one, wear it, look at it, and remember this verse this week. All right? All right, so the first, first thing that we can talk about today is about being nice. Being, being nice, this is, this is kind of something that we prize. This is something that's kind of important. It's, it's something that we would think is, is kind of a best thing, but it's one degree off. Being nice, being best, it's one degree off. Okay, here's, here's a sign. Deirdre knows where this is, but I don't think anybody else does. Um, the sign says, be nice or leave. <clears throat> we... we we, we, we prize being nice. We, we want people to be nice, and, and for good reason, right? And when people aren't nice, we don't really want them around that much, right? 
we want, we want people to get along, you know, we, we want to be cooperative, you know, smile, say, say hello, say good morning, be courteous, mind your own business, be nice. This is, this is good things, right? Being, being nice is, is very close to loving our neighbor as ourselves, actually. If you think about what being nice means, there's a lot of similarity between what it means to love your neighbor as yourself. Nine times out of ten, when we're interacting with other people, it's good to be agreeable and, and affirming, encouraging, polite, courteous. And we need to be these things to one another. Being, being nice overlaps quite a bit with the fruit of the Spirit, even. We talk about things like peace and kindness, goodness, gentleness, you know, being nice it kind of overlaps with those things quite a bit. And so it's very easy for us to think that you know, being nice, so that's what it means to, to love our neighbors as ourselves. That's what it means to have the fruit of the Spirit. So we just need to be nice. But being nice is one degree off. Being nice is also an easy excuse to avoid the hard work of relationships of any kind. Being nice becomes one degree off when we won't express a different opinion or we won't be honest about how we feel or what we think or we won't throw a yellow flag on destructive behavior. When being nice keeps us from doing these things, we're one degree off. And the more we go through life, the farther off we'll be from where God wants us to be. Now sometimes the right thing to do is not the nice thing to do. There's a lot of people that I talk to, a lot of ministry leaders, pastors, who aren't from this area. And they talk about how in this area is kind of unique, West Michigan, that there's polite smiles to somebody's face, but there's tearing down behind their back. And they have a term for it. They call it West Michigan nice. And it's not just one or two people. I've heard like four or five people say this. And so what we end up having here is kind of a fake nice where being nice is what it's all about, and we can't even be honest with each other anymore. And people who aren't from this area, they step right in this. They don't know how to navigate this. They don't know how to recognize when somebody's mad at them, even when they're, they're just smiling and being polite. And I've been, I've been in this class, this, this is our regional group of churches, the class of Zealand. I've been in this class this for 10 years. There's been three Article 17s of pastors and church separating. There's been a few other times when it didn't actually come to that. But there's been a lot of pastors who have come to serve in these areas here and have run into this West Michigan nice And they end up offending a ton of people and not even realizing it. And it ended up, it ends up separating very painfully, even. It's really sad. We can't be honest with each other very well. And this is especially true, I think, in this area. I've always lived here, I was growing up here, so. I never really noticed this or realized this, but the more I'm hearing some stories about what's happening and the more I'm thinking, okay, I would have responded that same way to you if you were my pastor, the more I'm starting to think, okay, this is something, there's there's something here. Turn to Matthew 18. Matthew 18, starting at verse 15. 
It says here, If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault, just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Sin must be confronted or it will explode and destroy. Today is September 11. And September 11 is a good example of what it means when we try to play nice and instead things just explode. In 1995, Osama bin Laden, he called for guerrilla attacks against U.S. forces in Saudi Arabia. Three months later, there was a terrorist attack against a U.S. military installation that killed five Americans. Didn't really do anything about it. February 1998, bin Laden says Muslims should kill Americans, including civilians, anywhere in the world. That same year, in August 7, there were two bombs that exploded in two embassies in Africa, one in Kenya, one in Tanzania. Hundreds of people were killed. Al-Qaeda took credit for those bombings. We launched a couple cruise missiles at a couple targets, and there were some arrests and some charges, but we didn't really do anything more than that. In October of 2000, there was a small boat that was loaded with explosives, and it plowed into the hull of the USS Cole that was in Yemen. And there were 17 American sailors killed, 38 injured. Bin Laden took credit for that attack. There were some investigations and some reports. And then there was September 11. Whatever your political persuasion is, I think it's safe to say that we missed some opportunities there. There were some things brewing that we weren't dealing with. We were playing nice. We were trying to just go after a couple people who were the direct perpetrators and we missed the big problem that we were facing. And this is what happened. When we don't deal with sin in our lives too, the same thing happens. It explodes. I still remember the, when being at Ground Zero for the first time after this had happened, and uh, there was there was all of these this fencing around the area where they were doing work, clearing rubble and and starting to rebuild and such, and there was people who had written all these different messages on on this this wood fencing that was around there. But one of them I still remember, and it said. We gave peace a chance, and look what happened. When we're being nice with evil, it will explode. Unaddressed sin in our lives will destroy marriages, friendships, families, churches, and I'll throw in their pastors too. We hamstring our relationships because we prefer the safety of being nice. And it happens a lot. I think we're really bad at this. We, this is, we are one degree off here. And we need to reevaluate what it means really to love our neighbors as ourselves. Look at the screen here with me, if you would, and answer the question with me. How is the kingdom of heaven closed and opened by Christian discipline? According to the command of Christ, those who, though called Christians, profess unchristian teachings or live unchristian lives, and after repeated and loving counsel, refuse to abandon their errors and wickedness, 
And after being reported to the church, that is to its officers, fail to respond also to their admonition, such persons the officers exclude from Christian fellowship by withholding the sacraments from them. And God Himself excludes them from the kingdom of Christ. Such persons, when promising and demonstrating genuine reform, are received again as members of Christ and of His church. This is one of the marks of the true church that we discipline one another, that we call each other on our mistakes and our errors. We don't do this ever, do we? And when we try to even, it it usually ends up as a disaster. And then it reinforces this belief that we should never do it at all. We're one degree off. In verse 15 of of what we just read here, it says, if your brother sins against you, your brother in the Bible, that's code for another believer, somebody in your church, or somebody who is also a Christian. If it says your neighbor, that means anybody who's around you. If it says your brother, your sister, that means somebody who's also a believer. Somebody else who is in Christ. Somebody who's been transformed by grace. Somebody who is looking to follow Christ more closely. When you call somebody who's been transformed by grace and looking to follow Christ more closely on their mistakes, they should want to improve, you would think. It says, go and show him his fault. We we are commanded here to address sin. If you notice, there's a text note there. It's the words, if your brother sins against you, the words against you, might not be in the original text. So this might even be talking about, you know that somebody is sinning. And you need to maybe address that. Whether it's against you or in general, it's just saying we need to call each other on our sins. And and this is not just, hey, maybe do that. No, this is a command. We have to do this. We must have the courage to confront. This is, this is important. This is what Jesus is telling us to do. In Psalm 141, verse 5, it literally says this, Let a righteous man strike me. It is a kindness. Let him rebuke me. It is oil on my head. My head will not refuse it. When we... When we call each other on our mistakes, that's a a good thing. It's supposed to be a good thing. And it says, just between the two of you, at least to start out, just between the two of you. Don't sound it from the rooftops. Don't go tell all your friends. Go just to that person. Just between the two of you. Talk to the person who hurt you, not about the person that hurt you. We're terrible at this. When somebody hurts us, the first person that we usually talk to is is all of our friends. It's called triangulating. Where instead of, if you have person A and person B and they have a problem with each other, instead of them talking to each other, they go and talk about the other person to somebody else. It's a mark of unhealthy, unhealthy systems of people, families, whatever. Something that we learned a lot about in seminary. And it happens all the time. It says, if he listens to you, then you have won. You've won your brother over. If he listens, you win. We must have love so that they will listen. It's really easy when we do actually confront somebody or call somebody on on something that's wrong to to actually be or to even appear like we're mean-spirited or just angry or bitter. 
or just trying to retaliate in some sort of way, and then it doesn't go well. And then we think, oh, I better not do that anymore. We have to love people when we call them on something. Otherwise, it's not going to go well. And if it doesn't go well even then, then it doesn't say, okay, drop it then. No, it, it says you, you keep following up. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I've ever done that. I don't know about any of you. I, I don't know of anybody who really goes that next step where you take one or two others along and then after that you go, you go to the church. And here's the thing. We all sin. So we will all need to be confronted sometimes. If we're never confronted or called on the things that we do wrong, what does that say? So, can we swallow our pride? Can, can we admit fault sometimes, even if we think that we're right? In Proverbs, there's a lot of verses that talk about how if you're wise, then you know how to accept a rebuke. So Proverbs 9, 8. Do not rebuke a mocker or he will hate you. Rebuke a wise man and he will love you. So if we can't take, if we can't take being called on something we've done wrong, we're, we're a mocker. Or in some other verses, a fool. If we can take, take that kind of feedback, even if it's kind of unpleasant, or maybe it hurts a little bit, if we can take that and learn from it and respond well to it, that's, what, that's wise. That's wisdom. Now, we have different standards sometimes about what we think is right and wrong. So sometimes, sometimes you know, whether it's, it's uh, what we wear or what kind of entertainment we consume, sometimes we have different standards or different ideas about what we should and shouldn't be doing. So sometimes we might be confronted about something and we might not agree. I still remember, uh, my, my mom's actually here, we, had, we were part of a homeschool group and um, there were some families that believed that all women needed to wear head coverings. And there were some women who went to my mom and said, you're not wearing a head covering, I don't think that's right, you're not following the Bible. We, we have different ideas about what it means to, to obey sometimes. But if you are confronted and you disagree, still receive it with thanks. This is wisdom. You can accept a rebuke, even if you don't agree with it. You don't have to be offended. You don't have to get defensive. Wisdom receives rebuke well. Maybe say something like, thank you, I'll, I'll pray about that. Or I'll study, I'll study scripture on that a little bit. Even if, even if you don't agree, receive it graciously. The greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then Jesus said, the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. That only appears one time in the Old Testament that Jesus quoted. Love your neighbor as yourself actually means confronting in honesty to avoid grudges. This is in your Bible reading track for today. It's from Leviticus 19. And I put it on the screen here. Do not hate your brother in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly so you will not share in his guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. The whole second commandment, the one that all other commandments hang on, is given in the context 
of not holding grudges and talking to people if you are offended or hurt by them so that we won't share in each other's guilt. That's a big deal. And we're terrible at this. I know I am. And if you look at Scripture and the way that God interacts with His people, even God isn't about being nice. He's about love. And those might overlap, but they are not the same thing. So Hebrews 12, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. And then it goes on, Our fathers disciplined us for a little while, as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Even God doesn't operate by the, the whole nice thing. God gives us challenges. He disciplines us. He gives us hard stuff to go through so that we will grow in our faith. Things that we wouldn't think are very nice. Nice and love are not the same thing. God's love is at stake here. If we can't confront, we can't love. We have to be able to call each other when we are off. When we do something wrong. I need it. I need it. I try to make a habit of every elders meeting to say, hey, how am I, how am I doing? How's my preaching? Am I, am I doing what I need to be doing? You know, what kind of feedback do you have for me? And once in a while, some people will have some feedback, and, and it's kind of a challenge to not be, be a little sensitive about that and kind of feel hurt a little bit. And but, but this is what we need. This is what we need to do. Proverbs 27, verse 5, Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Loving and calling each other on our, on our crap. They go together. So, we need to get good at confronting each other, and we need to get good at receiving that confrontation. We need to learn how to be able to receive that in grace, and we need to learn how to give that in love so that it doesn't just blow up and we all have hard feelings against each other. We need to learn to do this so that we learn to grow up and to improve and to be more like Christ, to, to follow what Jesus is telling us to do. Learn to love. Learn to rebuke. Learn to get good at giving it graciously, lovingly, kindly, gently, and learn how to receive it. Maybe say something like, you know, when you said this, that, you know, that kind of hurt. I don't want to guilt you out of it. I just wanted to let you know. Practice with people that you trust the most and work your way out there. Practice it. This is what Jesus calls us to do. This is what it means to love our neighbor as ourselves. Let's not be one degree off. Let's bow our heads and pray. Our Father in heaven, um, Lord, you've given us commands and instructions, and, and sometimes we are one degree off from what you have called us to do. Lord, help us to take these things to heart, to listen to you, to, to learn to adjust our course in life so that, Lord, we are truly loving you and loving our neighbors as ourselves. Teach us what this means and help us to persevere as we learn. In Jesus' name, amen.